Remember something, just because it's in print doesn't mean it's the gospel. I love you more. marks the day Michael Jackson was vindicated on all 14 charges in 2005. However, media's unprofessional coverage and false narratives ignoring the verdict altogether, even to this day, has led to suspicion and doubt amongst some people. Was Michael Jackson actually innocent or just not guilty? This video is all you need to know about Michael Jackson's cases, so let's begin. Ever since Michael Jackson was a child, as early as the age of five, all he did was perform. He was forced to live an adult life when he was merely a child, performing at places that were not suitable for a young kid, singing grown-up lyrics, attending business meetings, rehearsals, and tours. He was the front man of the group Jackson 5, which meant all eyes were on him. Not to mention the emotional and physical abuse he was enduring by his father, Joseph Jackson. When other kids were playing with their friends, Michael and his brothers were working, rehearsing, recording and sharpening their craft, and that's how his childhood years were passed. So as an adult, he never missed a chance to express how he felt that his childhood was stolen from him, and he never really got to do all the simple things most children do. My childhood was completely taken away from me. There was no Christmas, there was no birthdays. It was not a normal childhood, no normal pleasures of childhood. Those were exchanged for hard work, struggle and pain. But as an awful price, I cannot recreate that part of my life. Also, as a part of his religious beliefs, being raised a Jehovah's Witness, he felt as if it was his duty to help those in need, especially children, as he felt they shouldn't go through the pain of losing their childhood like he did. The first case happened in the summer of 1993, when Michael Jackson was accused of child sexual abuse by a 13-year-old Jordan Chandler and his father, Evan Chandler. He met Jordan and his stepfather, David Schwartz, in the May of 1992, and later on became friends with the whole family. Keep in mind that Michael would often befriend families and their children, such as the Cassio family. So hanging out with the Chandler family was not unique at all, and Jordan Chandler was not anyone special in his life, as opposed to some portrayals by the media or by Evan and Ray Chandler. I went up and shook Jordy's hand. He seemed like a nice kid. This wasn't the first time I'd met another kid through Michael. Like my own, Jordy's family was one of many families Michael befriended, although the Cassios were the only ones he called his second family. We Cassios were a big family ourselves, and we were more than happy to embrace Michael's friends. There was always room for more. To me, Jordy and his family seemed pleasant and unexceptional. Evan gets jealous of the friendship between his son and Michael, and he starts to form the fixed idea that the relationship between them is sexual. Although he has no evidence of it, and his son himself states to him that nothing inappropriate has happened. Probably, it is no coincidence that this suspicion of Evan emerges at the same time, when Jackson refuses to comply with his demands, such as building an addition to his house, or making him a partner in a film production company Jackson has just founded. He reveals his alleged concerns about the relationship between his son and Michael to a lawyer named Barry K. Rothman. Rothman offers to help him to end the relationship by either filing a restraining order against Jackson or a custody lawsuit against June. Evan Chandler's growing jealousy, mania, threats, temper tantrums, and weird sexual suggestions and questions was alienating Jordan more and more, and his relationship with Jordan was deteriorating. To a point where, despite demands from Evan, Jordan refused to call his father on Father's Day. Evan would leave a threatening message on June's answering machine, asking June, Michael, and Jordan to stop avoiding him. Since Jordy has repeatedly refused to return my phone calls, this will be my last voluntary attempt to communicate. He told me that his father was extremely jealous of Michael and thought it was weird that Mike was so close to Jordy and the rest of the family and that the relationship had become a problem for the Chandler family. I remember how Jordy had said that Evan had a terrible temper, that when he was upset, he'd scream and bang things around the house. In retrospect, it's not hard to see that Michael was a father figure to Jordy, that Jordy's mother was attached to Michael and that this most likely made for a problematic family dynamic. 
Jordan's stepfather, David Schwartz, tapes three telephone conversations he had with Evan Chandler and hands the tapes over to Michael Jackson's private investigator, Anthony Pelicano, a day later. The transcript of these conversations give us a great insight into Evan Chandler's concerns and his carefully calculated plan. Because this attorney I found, I interviewed several, and I picked the nastiest son of a bitch I could find. And all he wants to do is to get this out in the public as fast as he can, as big as he can, and humiliate as many people as he can. It could be a massacre if I don't get what I want. All I can think about is I only have one goal, and the goal is to get their attention. Totally humiliate him in every way. Let me put it to you this way, Dave. Nobody in this world was allowed to come between this family of June, me, and Jordy. That's evil. Evan's main problem seems to be that Michael Jackson allegedly broke up the family, and it seems to be about Evan's hurt ego and jealousy instead of his son being molested. He accuses Michael of coming between the family of June, me, and Jordy. However, according to June Chandler's 2005 testimony and Michael Jackson's trial, Evan neglected his son before Michael came into the picture. If I go through with this, I win big time. I will get everything. Thing I want. They will be destroyed forever. They will be destroyed. June is gonna lose Jordy. She will have no rights to see him again. This man is gonna be humiliated beyond belief. He will not believe it. He will not believe what's gonna happen. Beyond, beyond worst nightmares. Sell one more record. He claims to have evidence, but when this comes up, I mean, do you think that he's fucking him? I don't know. I have no idea. The fact is that there has never been any kind of physical or taped evidence that Evan could use against Jackson. In actuality, he was wary of going to the police because it would have been just Jordan's word against Michael's word. Pelicano meets with Jordan, and without Michael Jackson being present, he asks the boy very specific questions about whether he has ever been molested or inappropriately touched by Michael. The boy's answers to each and every question is that nothing inappropriate has ever been done to him. Jordan Chandler, who was living with his mother June Chandler, went to visit his father for a week, but at the end of the week, Evan Chandler refused to return the boy to his mother. This was the week when Jordan's allegations against Michael Jackson began to take form. The Chandlers claimed that the boy's confessions of abuse were made after Evan sedated him for a minor dental procedure. According to the Chandler's story, after Jordan emerged from the sedation, Evan pressured him to confess and corroborate his suspicions that Michael Jackson had sexually molested him. The boy refused. Then Evan started to blackmail him with lies and threats against his friend Michael Jackson. But when that didn't work either, his threats became more aggressive. All you have to do is say yes or no. That's it. Lie and Michael goes down. Tell me the truth and you save him. Ray Chandler writes in his book, in his heart, Evan already knew the truth. He didn't need Jordy to confirm it. In other words, Evan had a fixed preconceived idea that Jackson had molested his son and he would only accept a confirmation from Jordan as the truth. Everything else would be considered a lie and would result in Evan acting to taking down the entertainer. And this is when Jordan, after pleading his father not to hurt Jackson, allegedly, gave in and confirmed his suspicion. I was beyond shocked. The idea didn't even make sense to me. I had spent plenty of time with Jordy and Michael, and when I was at Neverland, Jordy never even stayed in Michael's room with us. Not once. I had never seen anything out of line happen, and I didn't believe anything had happened, not for a single second. Furthermore, Michael had never acted in any way even approximating inappropriate towards Eddie or me. This story was utterly unbelievable. I simply couldn't imagine Michael as a molester. Evan Chandler and Barry Rothman meet Pelicano in Rothman's office, where they make a demand for $20 million to not to turn to authorities and not to go public with allegations of child sexual abuse against Michael Jackson. With Michael's refusal and the approach of the deadline that the court set for Evan to return Jordan to June, Evan's frustration makes him take Jordan to Dr. Mathis Abrams, where Jordan makes his detailed allegations against Michael Jackson for the first time. This triggers a criminal investigation against the entertainer. As a result of the allegations, Evan does not have to return Jordan to his ex-wife despite the court's order a day before. Geraldine Hughes, the legal secretary of Evan's attorney, Barry Rothman, claimed that the boy spent several hours in Rothman's office alone with the attorney behind closed doors. 
I really believe that the whole thing was plotted and planned, and the words were given to him to say, because I actually witnessed the 13-year-old in my attorney's office without any supervision of his parents, and he was kind of snuck in there. Jordan Chandler never repeated his allegations in a court and was never cross-examined about them. Michael is using his age, experience, money, and his power to great advantage to Jordy. He could be the same person without the power and the money, and they wouldn't even be talking to him. He's a grown-up, and he's using his experience of his age in manipulating and coercing younger people who don't have as much of experience as him, and don't have the ability to say no to someone powerful like that. When he was asked what, in his opinion, was wrong with what allegedly was done to him, Jordan was unable to relate to the alleged experience emotionally. In the absence of Michael Jackson, who was on tour out of the USA at the time, search warrants are carried out on his premises. The Los Angeles Times wrote, Videotapes seized from homes belonging to Michael Jackson do not incriminate the entertainer, and the lack of physical evidence of alleged sexual molestation has left investigators scrambling to get statements from other potential victims. There's no medical evidence, no taped evidence, the source said. The search warrant didn't result in anything that would support a criminal filing. The Chandler's hire attorney, Gloria Alred, who gives a press conference where she states the accuser is willing to testify in a court. In reaction to that, a couple of days later, the Chandler's fire Alred and replace her with a civil attorney, Larry Feldman. According to Ray Chandler's book, this was because the Chandler family wanted to steer the case toward a highly profitable settlement, rather than a grand jury indictment and a criminal trial. Larry Feldman, on behalf of the Chandlers, files a $30 million civil lawsuit against Michael Jackson. Later on, Michael Jackson, who is still on tour at this point, cancels several more dates of his Dangerous World Tour due to serious health problems. He eventually cancels all the remaining dates of the tour after his Mexico concert due to his dependency on painkillers. In the meanwhile, police interviewed 40 to 60 children who had ever spent time with Michael or at his Neverland Ranch. No one corroborated the accuser's story. All of the children said nothing inappropriate or suspicious had ever been done to them by Jackson. I've told the police. In fact, if anybody wants to go back to 1993, when I was interviewed by the Santa Barbara Police Department, I sat there and I gave them the names. They're on record. They have all of this information, but they were scanning Michael Jackson. All they cared about was trying to find something on Michael Jackson. Who you said, by the way, did not abuse who you. Who Michael was innocent, and that was what the interview was about with the police in 1993. I told them, he is not that guy. And they said, well, maybe you just don't understand your friend. And I said, no, I know the difference between pedophiles and somebody who's not a pedophile because I've been molested. Something bad about a child that, that made me feel really mad. When you'd have sleepovers and you'd stay in the same room or the same bed, did that seem unusual to you at all? No. Nothing happened, you know? I mean, nothing, really. I mean, we played video games, you know? On December of 1993, Michael Jackson returns to the United States and is strip searched. His genitalia and body are photographed and videotaped by authorities to compare them with the description the accuser gave of Jackson's private parts. Based on the body search, no arrest warrant was issued. It was the most humiliating ordeal of my life, one that no person should ever have to suffer. The fact that Michael Jackson was not arrested after the strip search and indicted by any of the two grand juries which were convened against him indicates that, despite Snedden's claims, there was no match. Also notice how Larry Feldman, the civil attorney representing Jordan Chandler, said, Jackson may provide copies of the police photographs, submit to a second search, or the court may bar the photographs from the civil trial as evidence. So Jordan Chandler's attorney sought to get the photographs barred from the civil trial as evidence. When Michael Jackson's mother, Katherine Jackson, was called to testify in front of the Los Angeles County Grand Jury in the spring of 1994, investigators sought information from her as to whether her son had altered the appearance of his genitalia. Also. Jordan claimed that Michael Jackson was circumcised. We know by now for a fact that Jackson was not circumcised as per his autopsy. It was claimed the diagram was given to Evan Chandler by Jordan, so we are to believe that these were the words and writings of a 13-year-old. However, based on the instructions and notes like my theory, it rather seems to be an instructional brainstorming session 
speculating what Jackson's private parts looked like. The settlement clearly states that it shall not be considered as an admission of guilt and disclaims any wrongful acts against Jordan Chandler. It also acknowledges the fact that Michael Jackson is a public figure and that his name, image, and likeness have commercial value. Therefore, he has elected to settle the case, considering the impact the allegations has had and could have in the future on his earnings and potential income. The fact is, the settlement resolved the civil proceedings, not the criminal. In fact, under American law, one is not allowed to settle a criminal case. The criminal proceedings proceeded after the settlement, and nothing in the settlement prevented the Chandlers from testifying against Jackson in a criminal court. The Chandlers could have taken the settlement money and testified against Michael Jackson in a criminal case. They eventually chose not to, but it was not because they were forbidden to do so by the settlement. However, after the Chandlers received their settlement money, which was their goal from the beginning, they were unwilling to cooperate with the authorities investigating the criminal proceedings. Santa Barbara District Attorney Thomas Snedden and Los Angeles District Attorney make an official statement saying that Jordan Chandler is unwilling to testify, therefore they are unable to file charges. It is important to emphasize that it was the Chandler family who demanded a settlement from the very beginning and it was not Michael Jackson who sought it. In actuality, since the early August of 1993, Evan Chandler demanded money from the star, which Jackson refused to comply with and that is what resulted in the Chandlers going public with their allegations. Had Jackson wanted to quote unquote, hush the accuser, he would have paid them off before they turned to authorities and to the public because the Chandlers admittedly wanting nothing more than being paid off. Normally, civil complaints are only filed after criminal proceedings are completed and justice has been served. One would naturally expect the parents of a molested child to pursue justice and not money when they have the chance to do so. Why do you take money and not go to the police and prosecute? Particularly, you know, if you're a family member, do you prefer to take money instead of having police, or police and prosecutors go after you criminally? What does that tell you about the situation? The hostile media campaign against Michael Jackson might have also contributed to a decision to settle. Tabloid shows paid people for sensational stories that supported the allegations. Business partners and advisors urged him to put the matter out of his mind and get on with his life and business. The criminal case was convened before two grand juries, one in Los Angeles and one in Santa Barbara. After seven months of investigation, multiple house searches, interviews of dozens of children and other witnesses, police officers traveling all around the world to find corroborating victims and evidence, strip searching Jackson's body, both grand juries determined that they had not seen sufficient evidence to indict Jackson. The grand jury met for approximately six months and would not charge Michael Jackson with anything. Now, the one you're talking about never showed up. He's the one who got a settlement in the early 90s. Now, my understanding is the prosecutors tried to get him to show up, and he wouldn't. If he had, I had witnesses who were going to come in and say he told them it never happened, and that he would never talk to his parents again for what they made him say. And it turned out he had gone into court and gotten legal emancipation from his parents. His mother testified that she hadn't talked to him in 11 years. On November 18, 2003, an arrest warrant was issued for Michael Jackson based on a 13-year-old boy Gavin Arvizo's allegations that Jackson had sexually molested him in February and March of 2003. In June of 2000, a then 10-year-old boy Gavin Arvizo becomes ill with a rare type of cancer. While at the hospital, Gavin asks comedian Jamie Masada, who regularly visits him and whom he knows from the Laugh Factory, to help him meet certain celebrities. And one day, he asks to meet Michael Jackson. The Arvizos meet Michael Jackson in person for the first time after the first round of Gavin's chemotherapy. On that first visit, Gavin and Starr asked to sleep in Jackson's bedroom. This is the night that is referenced in the 2003 Martin Bashir documentary entitled Living with Michael Jackson that caused big public uproar. Even though both Gavin and Jackson made it clear that while the kids slept on the bed, Jackson slept on the floor. What is not mentioned in the documentary is the fact that not only Jackson did not sleep in the same bed as Gavin and Starr, but he also insisted on his personal assistance. Frank Cassio to sleep in the room as well. Michael says, okay, I have a solution for this. You have to sleep in the room with me. The two children slept on the bed and Michael and I slept on the floor. 
After the first personal encounter with the Arvizos in August 2000, there is not much contact between Gavin and Jackson until the shooting of the Martin Bashir documentary about two years later in September 2002. Gavin on the stand admitted that Jackson stopped calling him as early as in August through September 2000, and he complained that Michael actively avoided him. On September of 2002, British journalist and television host Martin Bashir works on a documentary with Michael Jackson entitled Meeting with Michael Jackson. During the creation of that documentary, Bashir suggested to Jackson that in the film he could show the public how Michael helped children with serious illnesses. Michael presented Bashir with two examples, the story of David Rothenberg, also known as Dave Dave, who was badly burned by his father when he was a child in the 1980s. He was almost, he was, it, metaphorically, he was almost like a father that I never had. The other option offered was cancer survivor Gavin Arvizo. By 2002, Rothenberg was an adult, and Bashir chose to go with the still 13-year-old Gavin instead, so they invited him and his siblings, Star and Devel, into the set, even though Rothenberg was present as well. According to Gavin's testimony, David Rothenberg was at Neverland around the same time Martin Bashir's documentary was being shot and on the same day Gavin was filmed. Gavin testified that he had met him. He looked like he was really badly burned. Did you and he appear in the film, if you know? Later I watched it and then, well, I watched my part and then I don't think he was in there. But was he at Neverland the day you were filmed? Yes. Michael Jackson trusted that Bashir had no hidden agenda in how he presented his relationship with Gavin, and out of naivety and guilelessness, allowed himself to be filmed showing affection to Gavin and holding his hand while the boy leaned his head on his shoulder. Bashir exploited Jackson's poor judgment in public relations and drew him into a discussion of whether it was acceptable to share a bedroom with a child. When the documentary aired in February 2003, the simming caused a storm of bad publicity for Jackson and wild speculations about the nature of his relationship with Gavin Arvizo. In reality, there was no close relationship between Jackson and Gavin. Throughout the documentary, Bashir uses suggestive and highly manipulative narration, and it seems that his intention from the beginning was to create a feed and innuendo about Michael's relationship with children. After the documentary aired, Michael Jackson's team was trying to do damage control regarding the Bashir documentary, and they were working on a so-called rebuttal video, which was eventually released as the footage you were never meant to see. Initially, the Arvizos would have been featured in it, but at the end, their segment was not included. However, the footage with the Arvizo family was made for the documentary. Initially, the Arvizos claimed that the molestation started on February 7, 2003. However, the Arvizo segment of the rebuttal video was shot on February 20th. Not just Gavin, but Star and Davelin, and me, and called us his family. Very innocent and beautiful relationship. It's a wish come true. <laughs> For example, to see my children interact with an ideal role, a father role model. Initially, they claimed that they were threatened to cooperate, but behind the scenes footage showed them not only laughing and joking, but making suggestions themselves about what they wanted to do on film. You know how Bashir zoomed in on, on him holding hands? Do that the same thing. Because you know. Because, because that's what a mother and, uh, and like, does with a son, does. or a father does with a son. Oh, we're on camera? Yeah. Oh. After the change in their timeline, the Arvizos claimed that Jackson had molested Gavin between February 20th and March 12th, 2003. So the story that the Arvizos eventually ended up with because of the fourth timeline change was that Michael Jackson had started molesting Gavin Arvizo while all this was already ongoing. A public outrage because of the Bashir documentary. As a result of that documentary, innuendo and allegations in the media about Jackson's relationship with children and specifically Gavin Arvizo, a high media interest, tabloids trying to hunt down the Arvizo family, a DCFS investigation another investigation by the Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Department, Jackson's PR and legal team working overtime on damage control because of the public relations backlash resulting from the Bashir documentary and its innuendo. To believe the Arvizo story, you have to believe that all while this was happening, Jackson suddenly started molesting Gavin Arvizo, even though for three years he had not touched him and not even trusted him and his family. 
You also have to believe that even though he had not molested Gavin until all these investigations by the DCFS and the Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Department began, he started molesting him while these investigations were ongoing. This is exactly the story that the Arvizo family ended up with after they were forced to change their initial timeline because of the discovery of the so-called rebuttal tape. Since there is no material evidence that would link Michael Jackson to the alleged crime, the case eventually came down to the credibility of the accuser and his family. In my opinion, I think we proved this, had assisted his mother in a false sexual harassment claim against J.C. Penney Storrs. He was a child who took a sworn deposition to support her claim that she'd been sexually attacked in a parking lot by security guards, and we proved it was completely, utterly bogus. Chris Tucker testified that this family, who was accusing Michael Jackson, had tried to hustle him. They wanted his car, they kept asking him for money, and he flew to Miami and he met Michael Jackson at a hotel and he said, be careful, something is wrong. Between 2003 and 2005, the Arvizos told their story several times. The public does not have access to each of these interviews, but the material that we do have access to already reveals a timeline that changed significantly during the course of the investigation, changing the allegations in content and creating a lot of contradictions. The number of alleged molestations claimed by Gavin changed a couple of times between 2003 and 2005. It went from at least five instances to less than five times to later seven occasions. By the time the case went to trial, this number became two. In an early interview in 2003, Gavin said that his grandmother told him that men have to masturbate, otherwise they may rape women. However, on the stand, Gavin claimed it was Michael who told him that. When confronted with the contradiction on the stand by Thomas Messereau, Gavin tried to get out of it by claiming they both told him the same thing. This isn't the only time their testimonies were contradictory. Watt Starr, Gavin's brother, had allegedly seen Michael do to his brother whether or not Gavin and Starr had ever been into Michael's room. Completely different accounts and stories of seeing Michael naked while Gavin didn't even know there were packages on Michael's body. Details about how and when Michael showed them pornographic magazines and websites, and Starr's initial claims to have been inappropriately touched as well, which was later disappeared altogether, are few of these contradictions. Janet Arvizo tried to portray Michael Jackson as the clingy one who tried to attach himself to her family and especially Gavin. However, this claim became hard to defend when during the investigation, cards and letters written by the Arvizo family to Jackson were discovered in which they begged for the singer's attention because he was not answering their phone calls. 10 felony counts, not guilty, four lesser included misdemeanor counts, not guilty. Didn't even hang them on misdemeanors. His kids went into his room, their parents were there too. The parents were allowed to stay over with the children. And the way it was mischaracterized and mispresented to try and get a conviction was scandalous. It was wrong. You know, like he always told me, you know, he mm -hmm. said, we're all put on earth to do something. Yeah. I was put here to help kids. And that was the drive of his whole life. Media. Just the way they reported the case was just remarkable. They would hear salacious testimony and the reporters would run out and report it. They would not wait for the cross most of the time or they'd want to ignore the cross. I think now, because I didn't have it thin, I compensate for that. I mean, people wonder why I always have children around because I, I find the thing that I never had through them. One of my big heroes is really Michael Jackson. Uh, he was. He was almost a metaphorical hero, and he was also a literal hero. It, metaphorically, he was almost like a father that I never had. Well, he was the big brother I never had, quite honestly. Um, he was everything to me as a kid. He taught me so many things. He's taught me about loving animals, vegetarianism, uh, animal rights, environmental issues, caring about your fans. Oh, I have nothing but amazing memories from the entire time that I knew him and was friends with him. I, I can't say enough good things. He just had this unconditional love. He was so pure. We loved him, uh, family, he was family. Yes, he's different. Yes, he's a musical genius. Yes, he's had his problems. Yes, he's a human being. And no, he's not a criminal. The magic, the wonder, the mystery, and the innocence of a child's heart are the seeds of creativity that will heal the world. I really believe that.